All righty. Thank you, everybody, for attending our second commercial stream session of the day. So today we are joined by David Kim. He is the engineering manager at LG Electronics. He will be pre uh, presenting on the benefit of using VRF systems in commercial and residential applications. So for the presentation today, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to log them in in the chat. I'll be monitoring uh, throughout the presentation today. Uh, he'll try to answer questions during the presentation. If it just doesn't work, we do have an allotted time at the end where we will make sure that any and all questions will be answered. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is David Kim again. I'm working for LG Electronics Canada as a engineering manager. I've been working for LG Electronics and the HVAC business for the past eight years, supporting engineers on the VRF application and also reaching out to the HQ on, and then also being involved in the product development as well for Canada. So this has been a, a busy eight years and then glad I'm honored to be here to present about the VRF technology and application that you can utilize for your next project. So. Just want to touch basis on the, on my presentation. All of the images will refer to my company LG, but then note that I'll be focused on the VRF technology itself, and the technology itself is common for all other manufacturers. So I will not only specifically talk about LG, but then as the technology itself. Okay. So today I'm just going to briefly talk about the electrification and why VRF is uh, getting its popularity these days, and then some of the VRF overview, some of the product lineups that are available in the market application and what is the future of VRF, okay? So I'm sure you guys heard of this countless of times about net zero. So Canada has joined over 120 countries to commit net zero emission by 2050, right? And as a midterm goal, they announced the 2030 emission reduction plan. This is to reduce the carbon emission by, reduce it by 40% in comparison to 2005, okay? However, if you see the trend of it, the overall emission has decreased, right, compared to the 2005 value from 761 megatons CO2 equivalent to 708 megatons. But then if you look into the building sector, right, the building sector, it did not decrease, rather it increased compared to 2005 data. So it was 84.9 before, but then now we're sitting at 88.8, .8, which means that there's a lot of work to be done in order to reach that 2030 reduction plan of zero carbon emission. And that is why the VRF comes into play, because the VRF, uh, it does not remove any of the gas, right? It's 100% electricity. So according to the ASHRAE handbook, the defini definition of the VRF is a multi-split system. Uh, air conditioner or heat pump with a single refrigerant circuit, one or more outdoor units, at least one variable speed compressor or other compressor combination that can vary system capacity by three or more steps, and multiple indoor unit fan coil units that are individually metered and individually controlled by integrated control device and a common communication network. So if you see the diagram of this, it is a very simple system. It involves the vapor compression refrigerant cycle. I'm sure you guys have seen this pH diagram before. It uses the refrigeration phase change metric to deliver the heat from one location to the other location. And this is a heat pump system, meaning that it can do both cooling and heating. And through this heat pump system, uh, it is very, very efficient because just think of it like this, electrical heaters, they convert 100% of electricity into 100% heat. So if you input 100%, you get 100% output. However, for the heat pump, generally at the rated condition, if you input 100%, you'll get 400% out of it. You'll get around four times more capacity than you input. And that is the beauty of the heat pump system. You're getting out more than what you input. So VRF itself is a very, very simple system. So it consists of the outdoor units, indoor units, and you just have to connect it by communication line and the refrigeration piping. And that's pretty much it. You don't need any pump. You don't need any, you know, strainers on the refrigeration piping line. That's all there is to it. Piping, communication line between the indoor and outdoor unit. That's how it works. And then you can add in additional controllers, essential controllers, wire controllers, depending on your application. But then the system itself for it to operate is very, very simple compared to the other conventional HVAC systems. 
And there is various types of indoor units available in the market. This is just some of the examples uh, and other manufacturers have different types of different looks of the indoor units available. But most commonly, most of the manufacturers have ducted type for ductwork. Uh, wall mount unit types for completely uh, complete system without any ducting, uh, cassettes, uh, floor sanding, and then some of the special applications such as a water heating device and also the third party AHU control device. So there's different types of VRF indoor units that can be used for your application all the time. And within VRF, there is two different types of system. There's heat pump and there's heat recovery. Heat pump is a generally just regular heat pump that can do cooling or heating. However, the downside of the heat pump system is that the indoor unit cannot do simultaneous operation between cooling and heating. All indoor units must be in one mode, either cooling or heating. It cannot do simultaneous operation. However, in heat recovery, you can do heat simultaneous operation. For example, on the diagram that I've shown here, here, some of the units can be worked as cooling operation, and also some of the units can be worked as a heating operation at the same time. Uh, there's two types of heat recovery systems out in the market right now. There's three pipe system, and then there's two pipe system. Uh, there's pros and cons for both of the system, but then generally the concept is the same. Uh, the concept is to have a heat recovered uh, and allow you to have simultaneous operation. Let's dive, let's dive a little bit deeper into how heat recovery system works, okay? This is a little concept diagram that I drew for the three pipe system, okay? Uh, as you guys know, the if you go back to the pH diagram, the heating happens on the condenser and then the cooling happens on the evaporator. Now, the hot gas from the outdoor unit will come out and then it will go to the indoor unit that requires heating. And then the refrigerant will condense, and then the byproduct is the high pressure liquid. And generally, in the heat pump system, this liquid will flow back to the outer unit. And then on the outer unit, it will be expanded, evaporated, and then goes back to the compressor. However, on the heated coverage system, rather than going to the outer unit, it will flow into the indoor unit that requires cooling. Right. So and then within the indoor unit, it will be expanded, evaporated, and the, the low pressure gas is going to be sucked into the outdoor unit. Therefore, on the very, very ideal scenario where uh, it rarely happens in the real life situation, there won't be any refrigeration going through the outdoor unit heat exchanger. All of the heat exchange will happen between the indoor unit. It's the outdoor unit will only be used for the compressor. So the low pressure liquid gas will come in, get compressed, and then high pressure gas will go out. That's the only purpose of the outdoor unit on a very ideal situation. Therefore, this is a very efficient system. We're basically recovering the heat and rather than dumping it outside, we're dumping it to the location within the, we're doing the heat transfer between the indoors. So compared to the heat pump, where you're dumping the air heat outside during the cooling mode, this is very efficient system. And this, this, that is why this system is being commonly known, commonly being used in the common residential or commercial applications where the zones are separated and that you require simultaneous operation throughout the year. There is different types of benefits that you can also think about on the VRF. Number one being uh, the flex flexibility of the VRF system. The footprint area of the VRF is really, really small compared to the other conventional system. For example, uh, the single frame unit that is available uh, on the VRF, uh, the maximum capacity out in the market right now is around 20 tons. And for example, if you make up uh, 100 tons, that means you only need five of those 20 ton system. And the footprint area of this 10, uh, 10, 100 ton system could be around 53 square feet. Comparing that to the conventional system as air cooled chiller, air cooled chiller itself 100 ton could be around 86 square feet. But then as well, because this is a hydronic system, you're going to need a boiler on top of it, right? So combining the air cooled chiller with the boiler, you're already past doubling the footprint area that is required compared to the VRF system. Now, if you compare it to the water cooled chiller, you're going to need a smaller uh, size than uh, the air cooled chiller. However, now you're going to need a cooling tower on top of it. Not only that, you're going to need a boiler as well. 
So the footprint area, the mechanical footprint area still remains uh, high compared to the VRF system. Excuse me. And on, not only that, you're going to need a lot of uh, other types of accessories such as pumps and valves. So with the VRF system, you can at least have saving of 32% and also save on the structural weight as well. Also, another thing about it is that during the construction, you don't need a heavy crane to lift up the, uh, the outdoor unit top onto the top of the roof. It can easily be fit into the uh, elevator as well if it's needed. Uh, and also the piping is not an issue. A lot of people think that, oh, with the refrigeration system, you have a refrigeration pipe limitation. But nowadays with uh, a lot of the manufacturers, the piping is not a limitation. I haven't seen, a, honestly, I haven't seen any of the project that has been limited by the, uh, the pipe length of the system. Uh, the conventional units systems, VRF system, can have the elevation between the outdoor unit and the indoor unit up to 100, 360 feet, which means that if you place the outdoor unit on the ground and also on the rooftop, you can cover 720 feet of elevation without having any mechanical room in the middle. So uh, the unit can be designed easily for high-rise buildings as well. Compared to the conventional hydronic system, for example, chiller system, the networking is completely sim is really simple because the VRF, all manufacturers supply both outdoor units and indoor units as a combo, right? There won't be any VRF system where the outdoor unit is supplied by M company and then the indoor unit is supplied by A company, right? All units are company will be supplied by a same company. Therefore, the control configuration is always built in. So you know you may require BMS if you want to have it, but then it is not a mandatory to have BMS system with the VRF system. Also, the space efficiency, as I mentioned earlier, you only the equipment space can be saved as well. But then also because it is a refrigeration pipe that goes throughout the building, you don't need a large duct work around the building. You just need a small refrigeration pipe that goes around the building as well. Mentioning the installation space, you can save uh, on the mechanical room as well. Uh, and then system expansion is easy as well because most of the VRS systems are modular. Commissioning part, you only need to commission outdoor and indoor units. And the key point is maintenance. You Theoretically, you only have to do filter cleaning and heat exchanger cleaning if the unit wants to work on pro properly. Uh, you don't need any other additional maintenance unless it is necessary. Now let's go over some of the VRF products that are available in the market, okay? Commonly in the VRF market, there's two types of VRF equipment. There is air source VRF and then water source VRF. The air source VRF means that the outdoor unit is doing heat exchange between the refrigerant and air. Water source VRF, as the name goes, is the heat outdoor unit is doing the heat exchange between the refrigerant and water. Uh, the more common one in the market right now, I would say is the air source, uh, three phase high capacity units. And for the residential or light commercial, the, we, we also have a side discharge uh, single phase units available in the market as well. Now going into the air source VRF system, there are some challenges to it, right? Uh, as, you might, as you guys may know, as the outside air temperature decreases, the heating capacity tends to decrease as well. And this is the physics, the fact about physics, thus uh, the heating capacity do decrease as the outside air temperature decreases. But most of the manufacturers have a, a, a VRS system that is specialized for the low ambient uh, heating condition. And the most common one nowadays in the market can go down to minus 30 Celsius uh, minus 30 Celsius for heating operation. This means that the manufacturers are guaranteeing that the unit's operation down to minus 30 C. However, it will have some capacity reduction at that temperature. But a lot of the technologies nowadays have been invented and then have been implemented into these equipments to counteract that, to allow heating more heating to be uh, outputted from this equipment at low ambient condition. Now, more one technology that are being implemented is the vapor injection. Now, vapor injection has been common for the other uh, technologies as well, but it has been proven to be effective at low ambient condition heating. 
So many of the VRF system do have this technology. Basically, what we do is we introduce the mid-temperature refrigerant during the compression cycle uh, to cause a double compression effect. By having this vapor injection, we can achieve low discharge air temperature while maintaining the high pressure level. And this has been proven to work properly and then effectively uh, to provide proper heating operation at low ambient condition. Not only that, many of the manufacturers are implementing their own technology to improve overall heating performance. Number one is the defrost, delaying the defrost. Uh, for example, when the unit is in uh, heating mode, obviously, because the outdoor unit is in evaporate, outdoor unit is working as an evaporator, there's going to be frost happening, occurring on the heat exchanger. And in order to melt down this frost, the system has to go into defrost mode. Now, what the defrost mode is, is basically it goes into cooling mode. Now, the outdoor unit now becomes the condenser. It emits heat to melt down any ice on the heat exchanger itself. And because during the defrost mode, you're in cooling, it disrupts the heating cycle. And therefore, the manufacturers are trying their best to delay this defrost operation as much as possible. One example could be introducing the humidity sensor on the outer unit to calculate the exact dew point temperature at a given time. And by, by calculating the dew point temperature, we can, we can adjust the evaporation temperature on the outer unit to delay the frost from occurring on the outer unit. Another operation that disrupts uh, the heating operation is the oil oil recovery cycle. Now, all, most of the VRF manufacturers has the oil separator right beside the compressor, but then this oil separator cannot separate the oil by 100%. Some of the oils will travel into the indoor unit piping. And now in order to retract all this oil on the refrigerant piping, the system again goes into cooling mode and then extracts all this refrigerant back into the accumulator to collect the oil. Now, uh, and this again delays the heating operation and the manufacturers has been trying their best to delay this oil recovery and also improving the compressor uh, to operate at low oil condition as well. Another thing that has been used to improve the heating operation, this is not also improving the heating operation, but then also uh, improving uh, its durability uh, is, to buy, is to introduce a hot gas uh, bypass on the bottom of the heat exchanger. So by introducing the hot gas bypass on the two bottom coils of the heat exchanger, uh, you basically have a heater on the bottom of the heat exchanger. This will prevent any of the ice accumulation from the bottom of the pan to prevent any of the ice accumulation. But still, with all that technology being implemented into the current market products, we still see VRF units with some of the D-rating in the heating capacity at extreme cold condition. And that is why many of the manufacturers have implemented this, this control logic that allows auxiliary heaters to be, implement, to be integrated with the VRF system. Some of the indoor units will have a relay kit that is required to be connected to the auxiliary heater to turn on the auxiliary heater, that's such as a hydronic heater coil or the baseboard heater, uh, the, if there is any heat, heating capacity derating. So which means that the heating, uh, this auxiliary heaters will not only turn on all the time, but then it will only turn on when it's necessary, when the heat pump derates and then it's not sufficient enough to keep up the heating demand that is required indoor. So, but then at the same time, it is best to uh, integrate these auxiliary heaters to the VRF manufacturer's control logic because we want to maximize the heat pump, the VRF operation as much as possible because in any case, even at low ambient condition, the VRF, even though it's providing less heating than rated condition, it is gonna be much more efficient than the standard electrical heater. So we wanna maximize the heating capacity output from the VRF as much as possible and only use the auxiliary heater when it's necessary. However, do you really need the auxiliary heater nowadays? Uh, this is a little data that I collected from the weather, uh, historical weather data from the Canadian government website uh, based on the Pearson Airport from October 2023 to April 2024. During this time uh, last year, I know that you know Toronto was kind of warm. We had a warm winter last year, but still they, we had zero hours under minus 15 C. This is not based on the maximum temperature. This is hourly temperature throughout this winter season. We had 0% or zero hours under minus 15 C. 
Uh, the reason why I'm uh, focusing on minus 15C or minus is that most of the VRF manufacturers can provide 100% heating capacity down to minus 12 or minus 15C. And so, which means that during the winter of Toronto around the greater Toronto area, you, the VRF heat pump system could be itself could, are, was sufficient enough to provide 100% heating throughout the season. And at minus 15C, the VRS system, the COP, which is, shows the efficiency of the heating, was at around 2.85. So it's a lot more efficient than electrical heater. And at the same time, that same equipment at minus 30C, the COP is around 2.26. So compared to the electrical heater that has a COP of 1, uh, the COP of 2.26 at minus 30C, even with the D rating, is a lot more efficient than the other conventional system. And that is why I've been saying on the previous slide to maximize the heating performance of the VRF as much as possible. Now going into the water source VRF, the water source VRF kind of uses the pros of chiller system and also the pros of the air code VRF system. A chiller has the pros of stability and applicability. Whereas the air-cooled VRF system is conven convenient and economic. So the water source VRF uses the pros of both systems. It's the combination of the both. Okay, uh, It's a VRF system, but then it does a heat exchange not with the air, but with the water. So depending on your application, you're probably going to need a cooling tower or boiler, or go with the geothermal if you don't want to use boiler or cooling tower. Excuse me. So compared to the water source VRF, compared to the air source VRF, the water source VRF does not require any defrost because it does not go, it, there is no frost occurring on the system. Uh, there is no performance derailing as long as you have a proper source of water coming into the system. The installation, installation location will be indoor. Uh, the water system is required uh, either by geothermal or by some other hydraulic system to maintain, to maintain the water temperature. Efficiency tends to be higher uh, because there won't be any derating happening. And because there is no derating, auxiliary heat is not required. And the heat recovery is happening on both indoor and outdoor unit. So this is conventional VRF water source. You're, compare, you're connecting to either the various source of heat source, uh, cooling tower, dry cooler, boiler, or if you don't want to see any greenhouse gas emission, you can connect it to uh, inverter scroll chiller, heat pump, or geothermal or natural water. Now, when I mentioned about the heat equipment happening between the indoor and outdoor, with the conventional air source VRF system, the heat recovery that I mentioned earlier is happening between the indoor units, only on the zone A portion, or between the indoor units. Now, the heat recovery between the outdoor and it can happen when the system are in the closed loop system and then they are connected into the same water loop. So if the, conden if the condenser or the outdoor unit is in cooling, it will discharge heat into the water. And if the condensers, the outdoor units are in heating mode, it will absorb the heat from the water. So if they, they're, these guys are doing the heat recovery between the other outdoor units. So there's, if you install the heat recovery system, the, each of the indoor units will be doing the heat recovery and the outdoor units can do the heat recovery between themselves as well, making it very, very efficient system. And with the water source VRF, the geothermal application is possible as well. Now let's go into some of the VRF application. So one of the applications that I can I would like to talk about is the zoning kit. Now I'm sure you guys heard about the B52 code with the VRF systems that with the R410A refrigerant, we have to follow 26 pounds for a thousand cubic feet uh, for a commercial or residential system. Now in the commercial application and also in the residential application, there could be a zone where we don't meet this requirement. We cannot meet this requirement. For example, if the meeting room is too small, but then you're uh, want to have HVAC equipment installed, you end up with a uh, with a problem where you have to divide the system into two to reduce the overall refrigeration refrigeration amount in the system, or we can use the zoning kit. So if the entire one indoor unit is serving multiple zones using a zoning dampers, now these multiple zones are now. Uh, 
considered as a one effective dispersal volume. So it is a very efficient way to combine or add up the volume of the meeting room by using a zoning dampers. And this is only obviously only available with the uh, ducted unit system. With the cassette or the Walmart unit, there isn't any option to do zoning dampers. Uh, so that indoor units are connected directly into that zone. But then with the ducting units, you have an option for a zoning damper to provide uh, proper heating and cooling to a small rooms, such as the medium room or the bedrooms. Another common application is the AHU combination. Uh, so many of the manufacturers VRF system can be connected to a third party AHU using a specific controller. And now if you have a project where you need car, where you require a makeup air unit or AHU, and if you want to replace retrofit the existing AHU unit, the VRF could be a perfect fit for it by just adding in the, uh, the new DX coil that, meet, that meets uh, the requirement of each manufacturer's need. And having this control kit with the EEV kit connected to the VRF, you can now have fully electrified uh, VRF system connected to a third party AHU unit. Uh, so basically the AHU will be a third party and then the VRF manufacturer will, will provide the outdoor unit, EEV kit and the controller. And there's two different types of the control method out in the market. One is the return air control, which controls the system based on the return air or the room temperature. Uh, second method is the supplier control, which is to control the system based on the discharge air temperature. Similarly, uh, there is another method called hot gas reheat, right? Uh, so we're using the heat coverage system. Now we can utilize the hot gas reheat for dehumidification for a makeup unit during the cooling operation. The main coil will be acting as a cooling operation. And now in order to uh, not introduce cool air into the room, you can reheat that using the hot gas line from the heat coverage system and using that to uh, boost up the temperature of the discharger back into uh, the temperature that you are uh, desiring. So this will have a dehumidification effect because you're the main coil is in cooling mode. And now you can also maintain the room temperature desired more without overcooling the zone. So this specific application is also possible using the VRF system. Additionally, there are options for air to water system. So typical VRF system is the air to air. So you have the outer unit that is absorbing the heat from the air and the indoor unit that is uh, distributing the heat to the air. However, with some of the indoor units such as this, we are not distributing the uh, heat to the air, but then we are injecting the heat into water. So uh, the outdoor unit will consume the heat from the air, and then the indoor unit will distribute the heat into water. So this will now work as a water heating system. This application can be worked in the various ways, such as uh, uh, for domestic hot water or also a in floor heating application. And if in order to obviously use it for both, you're gonna need a three-way valve and control the direction of the water depending on the demand. Another method is such thing as called such thing called water communication kit. This now water communication kit is similar to what we have seen earlier with the AHU. It's the third, it's a controller that allows you to have a VRF equipment connected to a third party heat exchanger. In this case, the previous case with the AHU, again, it was air to air. Now this one is to for air to water. Now we're heating up the water using the refrigerant. And it's similar to the hydro, uh, the initial, the previous slide that I showed you, uh, but then this one, because it is a third party, it is a lot more flexible in customizing the size of the heat exchanger. You're not limited to a single capacity of the indoor unit, but you can customize it and determine the capacity of the unit and then select the third-party heat exchanger according to your demand of the application. By using the water communication kit, uh, such thing, such this type of application is possible. Uh, you can connect the VRF to the water source heat pump uh, to supply the hydronic system for the residential condos, or even for any of the AHU that has a hydronic coil as well. Uh, so there could be a lot of different types of application that you can implement this idea into. 
and there's different types of control metrics as well. Uh, there, this differed by the manufacturer, but then most of the manufacturers do have similar control method. Number one is the dry contact. Now, by using the dry contact, the indoor unit or the outdoor unit can receive the outside contact signal to control our equipment. For example, it can be like a hotel room, hotel car key, where you input the car to operate the indoor unit or not. It could be doing with the third-party thermostat like Nest or Ecobee, excuse me, to receive 24 volt signal to operate the system. There could be different types of application according to your need and the dry contact controllers are made for that applications. We also have a central controller. Now, again, this may be different, different OS system for each of the manufacturers, but then the intention of the central controller is to view all the VRF system into a one controller. It's kind of like a, a small VRF BMS system. I think of it that way. Because VRF is modular system. You can have multiple different types of system installed in the system installed in the building. Now, by using the central controller, you can view all of that system into by a one controller. You can view each of the in outdoor unit, you can view each of the individual indoor unit, and also uh, you can access the central controllers through a static IP address, which means that you can access them anywhere in the world if you have as long as you have an internet connection that can uh, log into the system uh, so it is a very very uh, effective way to control and maintain and manage the vrf system and obviously we have different types of wire thermostat uh, each of the brands have different types different look different purpose wire thermostat uh, basically but then the basic need is is for it, the end users to select the desired set temperature and select the operation mode. Uh, all of them doing the same, serves the same purpose. Now for the special application, uh, some of the manufacturers have something called power distribution. Now this power distribution, what it does is it distributes the outdoor unit power consumption to the each of the indoor unit based on their operation, right? So it can be used for tenant building or the commercial building. Uh, and so that the power distribution indicator will determine which of the indoor units have used certain percentage of the outdoor unit power consumption. And based on using that percentage, uh, you can distribute that and then uh, use it for your application. And auxiliary heater relay is basically what I mentioned earlier uh, for you know auxiliary heater on the indoor unit. And the third party DX coil control is the AHU communication kit that I mentioned earlier uh, for uh, AHU or a makeup air unit application. And lastly, I'd like to cover something about the future of the VRF. Uh, I'm sure you guys all know that uh, the refrigerants are starting to phase out. The R410A refrigerants are phasing out uh, in North America. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but I'm sure you guys heard about the Montreal Protocol or Kigali Amendment uh, phasing out R22 and then phasing out the refrigerant with the high GWP. Uh, Canada haven't really announced any uh, specific dates to phase out the Minisplist or the VRF, but the EPA down in the U.S. announced that the Minisplist will be phased out in 2025, January 1st, and the VRF to be phased out uh, in uh, 2026, January 1st. Uh, but what is the next step? Uh, which refrigerant is going to be replacing the R410A? Uh, the answer to that is the A2L refrigerant, either R32 or 454B. A2L refrigerant means that they are slightly flammable. Uh, the meaning that is slightly flammable is it is really slightly flammable. Uh, it is really difficult to burn or ignite this refrigerant. Unlike R410A, R410A was completely non-flammable, you cannot ignite R410A. However, with the R32 or 44B, which is the common A2L refrigerant uh, that are being mentioned in the market, under a specific condition, it can ignite, under a specific condition. But then uh, during the normal condition, you know, it is very, very hard to ignite. And then if you remove the ignite source, it will not ignite. It's not like the butane or uh, propane that I've listed here as R290 and an R600. It is, those are considered A3 refrigerant, but then A2L is very slightly flammable. But at the same time, because it is A2L refrigerant, a lot of people are questioning, 
what's going to happen to the VRF that uses H2O. Now, as I mentioned earlier, B52 code, uh, the RCL of the R410A was 26 pounds for 1,000 cubic feet. Now, this is now being reduced down to 4.8 pounds for 1,000 cubic feet for R32 and 3.1 pounds for 1,000 cubic feet for R454B, which means that in a zone of 1,000 cubic feet with the R410A, you could have had the system with the 26 pounds of refrigerant, but with the R32, you can now only have 4.8 pounds of refrigerant leaked into that room, which means that you, get a, you have to have a smaller system compared to the R410A. But then the recent update of the B52 code back in 2023 in December introduced the concept of MREL, the Releasable Refrigerant Charge Calculation. So in the past with the R410A, we had to assume that the entire refrigerant in the system are being leaked into that smallest room that is connected in the system. However, with the with the, uh, the update of the B52 code, you can now only assume that you know, with the introduction of the shutoff valve, only a small portion of the refrigerant is going to be leaked. For example, if you look into this diagram, I have put in the shutoff valve kit in this location. Okay, and assuming that the leak happened on this indoor unit. Now, not all the refrigerant will not leak into this room. Once the shutoff valve closes, these refrigerant on the outside of the shutoff valve will not leak into this room. Only the refrigerant inside this unit will leak. So this calculation includes three, three concepts, three portions. Number one is the refrigerant leaked while the refrigerant is detected. Number two is the refrigerant leaked while uh, the shutoff valve was closing. And number three is the refrigerant leaked after the shutoff valve have closed. So combining also all three metrics, uh, you can now calculate the new refrigerant charge that's going to be leaked into that room. And this is basically the new concept of the VRF. Uh, now, I have included the shutoff valve kit in this diagram, but then many of the manufacturers are now including this shutoff valve kit inside the HR unit. So if you're using the heat coverage system, you will not require additional shutoff valve kit. But if you're using the heat pump system, yes, you will require a shutoff valve kit. But now this shutoff valve kit is now designed to shut off when the indoor unit detects the leak into that zone. Right, and only uh, you can now calculate uh, the MREL based on this length of the pipe between the indoor unit and the location of the shutoff valve, and the volume of the indoor unit. Now, I, I don't, I did, I did not include the slide where I made the calculation, uh, but by using this method, it can significantly reduce the total amount of refrigerant that is leaked into the room more so that it makes VRF more flexible than the r 4 a I had a project where uh, the system had to be divided into two because with the r 4 a we could not meet uh, 26 pounds per thousand cubic feet uh, B52 code. So we had to uh, divide the system into two to reduce the overall refrigerant uh, amount into a system. But hey, I, I, I thought about it and I was like, okay, let's see how that system Will, will change with this new rule of shutoff valve. And when I did it, it was okay. Basically, I was able to design as is. I didn't have to break the system into half. I could have kept it as is with the R32. So just thinking about it as is, the system will be much more flexible to design with the, B50, uh, the R32 according to the new B52 code and also which aligns with the Azure A15 down in the US as well. And that concludes my presentation about the VRF application and the future of the VRF. Uh, I'd like to ask if you guys have any uh, questions or... Feel free, free to log in on, on the chat. If anybody has any questions, we'll make sure that they get answered. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks, to, uh, David. Thank you. All 
If nobody wants to ask any questions now, uh, David's information should be still up on the screen. Uh, so you guys, I'm sure, are more than welcome to reach out to David following today's presentation with any questions as well. Um, otherwise, we still have plenty of time. Okay, here we go. Wonderful. Max has a question. So are there A2L-based RFCs, RF, sorry, VRF systems on the market today? I have, I have personally not have seen any of the R32 VRF in the Canadian market as of right now, but I know that in the European market, they do have the R32 uh, VRF system. Uh, Europe has always been the leader and well, I'll say not the leader, but then the North, I'll say, okay, North America always lagged compared to the Europe in the refrigerant changes, right? And then the Europe always, I believe the A2 refrigerant was launched in Europe like five or six years ago. Uh, they already had the R32 back then. So VRF R3, with the R32 is available in Europe, but I haven't seen any of the A2 refrigerant VRF system in North America yet. Yeah, that's what I always hear too. I usually hear that Canada, North America is about five to 10 years behind Europe in a lot of the innovations. So, all right, Glenn has a question. Hello again, Glenn. Thanks for asking questions. Uh, is there, he was asking questions in our last presentation too. So appreciate you, Glenn. Is there a chance to get more information on the uh, adaptation for air handler units? Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you can shoot me an email, my email is listed in the presentation there. Uh, if you can shoot me an email about it, I can gladly give you some explanation about how you can adapt the VRF system to the AHU. Uh, the reason why is, you know, each of the manufacturers has a different method to it, so I cannot give you in general on how you can uh, adapt the VRF system to the AHU, but then I, if you shoot me an email, I can definitely give you a guideline on how you can connect it to the LG VRF system. All right, I made note of that too, Glenn. So um, I'll probably reach out as well after just making sure that you have David's contact information as well. Um, any more questions Questions want to straggle on in? We got some more time still. Don't be shy. Glenn says thanks. Thank you. All right, I'll give it another at least a minute. So you got some time. So don't feel, don't be nervous about asking any questions. Now it's the time, guys. Now it's the time. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do my start doing my little wrap up now. If any other questions come in, I'll stop and uh, I will read out the question. Okay. Otherwise, thank you very much, David, uh, for your presentation you. today. That was fantastic. And again, thanks to everybody that's joined in on our presentation today as well. Uh, we have two more presentations left in the day, if my notes are correct. Uh, so we should have in our residential side, we have our geothermal solutions, which will be presented by my, uh, Michael Riddler at Eaton Energy Equipment. And then we also have a, on our commercial stream, we have our presentation on decarbonization and high efficiency electrification for heating systems. Uh, that presentation will be conducted by Lucas at over at Train. So thank you very much, everyone who participated in this. Again, you guys will get a little bit of a break then before your next session. And I will see you guys all there. And again, thank you, David. Thank you very much. All right.